place but dreams are not known Sick of the strength that it takes to keep going Sick as I'm losing this fight and it's showing This is Rumble and this is Michael Moore and I um, have as my guest today a man by the name of Wendell Potter. Wendell was the vice president uh, of the healthcare, health insurance, I should say, giant, uh, Cigna. I'm sure you've heard of them. And um, uh, Wendell, the first time we met, actually, you had been sent to spy on me, if if I'm correct. There was a, a, I'll let you tell the story, but there was a Saturday meeting when it got out that I was making a movie about America's healthcare situation. Uh, it was called Sicko, but uh, we were just in the process of making it. And um, the health insurance companies and the um, pharma companies, everybody, I don't know, some meeting was called in Philadelphia. You were there because as the representative of, of, of a top, you're a top executive at Cigna. And um, tell us about that meeting and then the mission that you were sent on to um um, to essentially to spy on me and my movie. Yeah, that was a very important meeting because it was at that meeting that we were beginning to plan how we might uh, at least proverbially, proverbially push you off a cliff. Uh, we had known in off the, the cliff, off, off the, the cliff. off the, the in, cliff. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> we were going to do whatever we could to uh, uh, try to uh, defame you, to make people think that you were out of step with uh, uh, with uh, with Americans. Mm-hmm. Thinking on healthcare, uh, we actually began our work months and months before that, uh, Michael. In fact, from the very first time that we learned uh, that you were doing a new movie and that we focused on healthcare, uh, everybody in healthcare, uh, insurance companies, pharmaceutical companies, big hospitals were just terrified. Uh, and so we began uh, uh, trying to figure out anything we could about what you were up to. And uh, I, among other things, went back and re- looked at every single episode of uh, your TV shows, TV Nation and The Awful Truth. I uh, watched every one of your movies. I'd seen mon- many of them before because I was a closet fan during this time. And uh, but as that, that meeting on Saturday uh, was to uh, try to figure out how could we find out what was actually in the movie. There had been a lot of rumors we didn't know for sure that at that point that it was going to be targeting health insurance in this country, or as it turned out, of course, about people who have insurance but are screwed by their insurance companies. So a decision was made for me to be sent to Michigan for the, uh, the first uh, public premiere of the movie in Bel Air, Michigan. I know you know it well. You remember it. I, uh, had- it's, a little, it's a little town of, I don't know, eight or 900 people. I was living up there in Northern Michigan, right? And so they have a little tiny um, movie theater on the two block main street. And um, I, I thought, you know what we should do? We should have like the big world premiere <laughs> of it here <laughs> in this little town where we, uh, where we live. And so that's, that's what we did. And we, you know, so I'll, I'll let you pick it up from there. So you, so you, you flew into Traverse City, Michigan. Yeah, and I, right? I rented a car. Actually, I think I flew into Detroit. I think I flew into Detroit or Traverse. I didn't know where the hell Bel Air was. And, uh, right, nobody uh, does. And so I got, Nor should I, they. I, I think it probably was Traverse City that I flew to. And I, I brought my son with me, who was uh, uh, still oh, in that's college right. you had at your, the time. Yeah. Was he in college or was he a teenager? He was. He was. He had just begun. In, he was just in college. But he, uh, he had long had this uh, fascination with, with you, Michael. And uh, loved, I think he had had encouraged me to watch some of your movies uh, long before I began uh, becoming a fan. Uh, and uh, so I, I decided, well, if I'm going to have to go to Bel Air, Michigan to see a Michael Moore documentary. And I Wait, how, were you, how were you sent there, though? Did you draw? Did you draw the short straw? <laughs> uh, why, did, why didn't the, the, the vice president of Humana go or of Pfizer or whoever else was at the table there? Well, I was kind of selected because this was in Philadelphia and Cigna was based in Philadelphia. It was sort of the meeting that I had uh, convened with my peers across the industry. And uh, I raised my hand to go. I wanted to see it. I wanted to see uh, firsthand uh, how the movie was coming together. And I needed to know, Michael, how Cigna in particular was being depicted in the movie, how it was being portrayed, what kind of stories mm. there were about Cigna. I assumed that there would be. 
Uh, and uh, mm-hmm. uh, I, uh, I had, by the way, in advance of this, anticipating that you would show up at Cigna or somewhere, uh, I had media trained the my CEO and all of our medical directors, all of our executives around the country, because I just was concerned uh, uh, that you might show up with the film crew and and try to uh, do an ambush interview with our CEO. So he wasn't about now, to. Go. I've learned. I've learned since then. You weren't the only company to do that. <laughs> all the other insurance companies did. Some of them did like in in house training and service training for employees. What to do if Michael Moore shows up. Oh, yeah. um, one of the pharma companies, I believe, hired a Michael Moore impersonator, like an actor that looked like me. To God, God bless him too. Uh, <laughs> to 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 like to have me cut, you know, have the the actor came in with the camera and the microphone and where's where's the CEO and uh, and yes, there it, it was it was and it was you're right it was pharma it was the big hospital corporations, yeah. um, uh, Pfizer even set up a Michael Moore hotline. It was an actual hotline. It was sent to all Pfizer outlets across the world that should I show up, this is the special 212 number uh, uh, to call. I mean, there, there. I didn't realize this at the time, but there was, it seemed a very sincere panic. Oh, there that, was. Um, and, and, you know, and, and, and we'll get to this in a minute, but I'm, I'm, well, we'll get to why they they all were under such fear that I might have the goods uh, uh, on them, but go ahead. pick. Yeah. Up and, and in fact, for a long time, we were pretty certain that it was going to be the pharmaceutical industry that you were coming after. Uh, so those yeah, of us, what, that, yeah. And all are, the pharma companies, the, yeah. all the people that work there since then, when I run into somebody, they tell me we were certain it was us. It was either <laughs> right. pharma insurance or the hospital corporations. And, right. and we, of course it's, you know, but again, that's just assuming I would, I would, I would shoot for the easiest fish in the barrel. That would be the that would be the pharma companies, right? Yeah, that would be, uh, it maybe be too obvious. But we did too something obvious. Okay, let me yeah. let's pick it back up here. So you've flown into Traverse City, Northern Michigan. Right now, you're you've rented a car. You've got to drive an hour to this little village in yeah. the middle of nowhere. For sure. Um, and uh, it's called Antrim County. Uh, th- this is a. I was just hearing from somebody back home. Antrim County. The total number of ICU units, as they're trying to deal with the current pandemic right now, total number of ICU units in Antrim County, Michigan, zero. I'm not sure. Um, I'm not surprised. So we'll, yeah. yeah. So we'll pick it back up there. You're in the car. You've got your son with you who happens to be a fan of, of my movies. Yeah. And uh, I, I was – Alex, my son Alex, didn't really understand a lot of what I did for a living because I didn't come home and, and explain that I was a propagandist for the insurance industry. But I felt that this would be an important, I don't know, there's just something uh, about this trip uh, and bringing Alex with me to see this. Uh, I, I, even ad- before this, Michael, was beginning to have my crisis of conscience. And I knew that I was somewhat predisposed to be influenced by this movie. Uh, I, uh, I had handled so many horror stories uh, along the lines of what you depicted in, in the movie, uh, that I was... Uh, uh, a bit scared about what would actually be on the screen when I saw it. Uh, I was certain there would be some Cigna stories there. I didn't know that. But I thought uh, I, this would be a way for my son to have a, a good understanding or a better understanding of what I did for a living. Uh, and and uh, maybe he and I could have a, a real uh, father-to-son talk about what I did for a living and what I might do next. Because I was... Uh, I, I was at the point in my career that I knew that I needed to do something other than what I was doing. I agreed to go on this spy mm-hmm. mission. Uh, my assignment uh, was actually to gather intelligence to discredit the movie, to discredit you, uh, and to be equipped to defend Cigna against whatever it was that you uh, would have uh, in the movie that referenced Cigna. Uh, but I, um, I, 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 I probably wouldn't have taken him had I not already begun the process of just trying to figure out how can I get out of this job that I'm in, out of this career that I've had now for 20 years working inside wow. Cigna and Humana before that. Uh, I worked for and Humana. you were vice president of what, communications or I was. whatever they call yeah. it? Yeah, yeah. As you say, it propaganda. It was, it was, I was a, I was a chief, prop, chief propagandist for the company and I worked uh, uh uh, at high levels in the trade association for health insurance companies. Uh, I led uh, or co-led a lot of the meetings that we had uh, to help develop strategies to push back against any kind of health care reform that was proposed at the federal or state levels that we didn't like. Uh, incidentally, uh, we had many, many conference calls uh, prior to 
my going to Michigan when we talked about the movie and trying to gather intelligence. And we had a code name for you. We called you uh, Hollywood. Uh, and uh, we, oh, we, we chose well, thank that. thank you. Yeah, we chose that in particular because one of the, the things that we wanted to try to persuade people to believe was that you were uh, Hollywood filmmaker Michael Moore. We always use that because we felt that that might be in some ways uh, uh, code for people, at least on the right, to uh, yeah. uh, to not accept the movie. And to, Hollywood liberal. Yeah. yeah, Hollywood liberal. That's exactly right. And, and therefore they wouldn't accept the movie. Yeah. Wow, this is quite an elaborate. You guys have really thought this out. Oh, we had. We hired a big PR firm uh, 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 to, to help us with this. I worked with uh, America's Health Insurance Plans, which is the big trade association for uh, for health insurance companies. It still is. Uh, so we had numerous meetings and the, the PR firm we hired was Atco Worldwide. Uh, it's, it's an offshoot of the uh, law firm uh, Arnold and Porter that has a long history of, of working with uh, tobacco companies and other uh, fine institutions over the years to bamboozle the public. So they were, they, we, were in, we were working with them to develop this PR strategy and my trip to to Michigan was part of that strategy so that I could come back and report what I saw mm. uh, during the so, first. So you first land screen. there, you land, you're right. So you land there at the airport. Um, you get the rental car. Now did, did the trunk of the rental car <laughs> hold all the sniper equipment that you had to load in, you know, you brought it in <laughs> duffel bags and golf bags. Uh, I I've seen three days of the condor. So I know pretty much what was to, supposed to happen here. Uh, watch the movie, uh, take notes. Then, then I disappear. Uh, but that, but <laughs> I'm just kidding. Um, so, so you drive, so you come to this little town. Now tell me what that was like. Cause you know, the, the little street I'm talking about, this is about as small town as a small town, uh, can get. It's not even a town. It's, uh, yeah, it was uh, two streets. We, yeah. We had, uh, uh, I think there was a, a bed and breakfast in town that we found and, uh, uh, went there to find out where the screening was. And, and it was pretty evident, I guess, once we started looking around the town and you're right, there's not, a, not a whole lot there. Um, um, my daughter got married on the lawn of that bed and breakfast. By oh, the is way. that right? Yeah, yeah very, yeah. very fine Anyways, place. I recommend it. it was nice, they're nice, nice people. <laughs> yeah. So okay, the, you stayed at the bed and breakfast, and then and then what happened? Well, we had uh, I had written ahead uh, to to get tickets, and I guess no one, you know, I didn't put my affiliation. I I got tickets in the mail, mailed to me to come to the premiere. I thought, wow, this is pretty cool. Uh, yeah, that's how we are. Yeah, just, just, just very, very casual. Note. I'll send uh, you tickets. Right, right. And then, that's exactly what happened. I got tickets sent to me, two two tickets, and uh, so Alex and I, I made a point. It's not of very time. Hollywood, is it? Not a, not a, not a bit <laughs> Hollywood. I've been to Hollywood, and it was this is not Hollywood. <laughs> <laughs> All right, go ahead. And we, uh, uh, I, I told Alex we had to blend in, and uh, uh, we there was I think some kind of a little gathering before the the, the showing of the film, and uh, then we watched the movie. And then uh, uh, I, uh, there, were, there were parts of the movie, Michael, that uh, just really brought me to tears. It was, uh, it was so moving for me, and Alex was, was watching and seeing my reaction to what I was seeing on the screen. And there was one scene in particular. Uh, uh, you, you undoubtedly remember this. Uh, a father was talking about his, his daughter who needed cochlear ear implants, and Cigna was refusing to pay for it. Pay for them. She needed two. Cigna, I think, agreed to pay for one, but not for both. And um, uh, uh, I, you know, as a parent, I just uh, was just moved to tears at what mm. he was having to go through to try to get what his daughter needed, and the, mm. the battles that he had to fight with Cigna. Uh, and uh, it, it just hit home to me because, like I said, I had handled so many. We call them horror stories internally, uh, or high-profile stories when someone would would have a, a complaint. Uh, sometimes they'd go to the media. Sometimes they would go to a lawmaker. And ultimately, I'd find out about it and have to defend the company or try to defend the company. So uh, uh, this was, it was, you did a hell of a good job. And I know I learned later uh, that you had spent an enormous amount of time fact-checking to make sure everything was all buttoned up. And there was no disputing the stories that you told in that, in that, uh, in that movie. Uh, and you, and you, you got it right. Uh, afterwards, I, at this reception, uh, I, I told Alex there might be a chance uh, that, that we could meet you. And uh, uh, he was so excited. And we went to this little reception. Uh, and uh, sh sure enough, you, you come in. And uh, I finally got the nerve to uh, go up to you and say, hello, Michael. My name is Wendell. This is my son, Alex. And I certainly made a point of not saying my, I don't think I even said my full name. Or certainly not that I was working for Cigna. 
uh, it was it was uh, still undercover uh, until you know until I wrote the book. No one knew anything about uh, exactly what I did. Uh, but uh, I just fill in a little bit about that one scene in the movie with yeah. Cigna. So so this all of a sudden you're watching the movie and then here comes Cigna and you're like you must have did you, did you were you bracing yourself? Oh, I did. oh yeah yeah. What's yeah. going to happen here? Yeah. yeah. Um, but but for people who haven't seen the movie, as Wendell said, um, uh, a father contacted me, a father, a father and a mother of a young child. And this happened a lot, Wendell, actually, while I was making the film. The public, it, you know, it sort of gotten out there. People knew that I was making this healthcare film. And um, people started sending me, uh, you know, different. Well, I, I asked people actually online to send me their what I called their healthcare horror stories. and. Um, I received 25,000 of these emails oh my God. of people just describing the most God awful things. And, and, and what I was looking for, you know, you're right. A lot of people thought it was, if I was going to make a movie about health insurance, it was going to be about why are there 50 million Americans that don't have health insurance? That would be the typical film, I guess, a you know, liberal documentary filmmaker would make, but I wasn't interested in that. I mean, I am interested in it, but you don't need to make a 90 minute movie to tell people that, we shouldn't have 50 million uninsured people. Um, and I don't need to show you a bunch of, of very sad stories about the people who lose loved ones because they don't have health insurance. If you need a movie for that, then I can't help you. But because I'd heard so many stories from people who had health insurance, really good health insurance. And when it came time, when they finally needed it, uh, the health insurance company did everything they could to not pay the doctor, not pay the hospital bill, not approve the treatment over and over. It was stunning. And I just, we were like, wow. Cause we all, you know, everybody who works for me, you know, excellent healthcare. And at that time, the health insurance companies, I, when I, when I covered my whole crew and my, all my staff, um, if you worked for me, it was no deductible, no copay. I mean, I literally paid it. I paid for everything and they don't allow that anymore. You can't, you can't buy that plan anymore. They insist that there be a deductible and a copay, but I'm, I'm getting off track here. So anyway, so what happened was people on their own, knowing I was making this film, if they were having a trouble with their health insurance company, they would call up the health insurance company and say things like, you know, I got Michael Moore coming over here on Saturday to film me for what, you're, what you've done to me. Or in this case, this particular parent left a message on the, on the Cigna, you know, main line on the after hours uh, voicemail that said, uh, uh, listen, Michael Moore is coming here next week. Uh, this is the case. My daughter um, left the information about the case. Uh, you have told me that um, as the as the person that put it to her, or as the doctor said, what the health insurance company said to him was that um, you only need one ear to hear. So Cigna, we're not, not going to pay for both ears, so the, the cochlear implant in both ears, just one ear. Um, uh, you know, you only need one kidney. You know, so it's like, it was that kind of the way it was put. And so he lied to the Cigna voice machine saying he'd never met me, never called me, he didn't know me, but he he was one, I can't tell you of how many dozens, if not even hundreds of people were doing this during the year I was making the film or on their own, they were saying they were going to be in the film if X didn't do Y for them. And, um, and this dad, this left this mess, it's in the film where he says um, uh, he'll be, he'll be coming here. And the very next day, um, an, um, uh, a message was left on his voice machine saying, Hey, thanks uh, for, you know, we've, we've looked into this and uh, you're right. Uh, there should be a, a cochlear implant in both ears. Ah. And, <laughs> and, and he kept, he kept it. So when we went to see him, he played it for us and we were able to, and sure enough, there's the cute little girl uh, who can hear him both ears now. Ah. And, and we started thinking, wow, what, what genius that people will do that have to do because they, they're, they're trying to, they're trying to help their kids. Yeah. And they'll, you know, of course you'll do anything. And it was really, it was an amazing thing to see. And, and if you remember when the, when the film came out, I, I made a blanket uh, statement on one of the, on, I don't know if it was uh, Letterman or Jay Leno. I said, everybody watching this, everybody who sees the film has my blanket permission to say the following. Michael Moore is arriving next week <laughs> to film uh, this 
<laughs> situation. <laughs> and we even made up little cards, like a little business, like a little card, like I'd left behind with, with the parents uh, that they could use to show the the doctor or the health insurance company that that I indeed was coming, and um, and anything to help them get the 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 treatment or the help medically that they needed. I I was I just I so admired these these people and these parents who who just on their own did this. And so they didn't. So thus Cigna ends up in the movie as a result of this. And there you are, you're watching the, the Cigna scene during the, and of course there's all these other awful, God awful scenes in the movie of what we do to our own people. And then of course, in the movie, I go to other countries that don't do this to their own people. And during the film, you're sitting there with your son, um, with Alex, what, and you said, you know, he, he looked over at you and you had teared up um, at this, um, he's sitting there. He's your son. He know he does know what you do for a living. Yeah. He knows that you work for this company. Um, you know, you had said to me, um, long after you failed to fire the sniper's rifle, <laughs> long after I disarmed you, uh, <laughs> you said to me though, that it was, um, when it was a powerful moment in your life, when you, you, cause this is your son and all of us want our sons and daughters to be proud of us yeah. and, and what we do. And in that moment, you felt this enormous sense of shame, uh, come over you, uh, because he was looking at you and, you know, maybe you can, you could take it from there, but that's, I remember you telling me that I was very moved when you, when you yeah, told me that. And, and, and it's true. Uh, and I think I did this. Um, I think there was some premeditation to this. Like I said, I, I knew what I was doing for a living was not honest, and I was trying to find a way out. And I think, uh, in a way, I was, I was looking for Alex to hold me accountable, my, my, my young son, um, uh, and to, uh, for him to see in a movie more of what I was doing than I could explain to him uh, in person uh, or in our daily conversations. And, uh, and, and I, 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 I have to give Alex a ton of credit for doing exactly that, for uh, for holding me accountable, to asking me more questions than he had asked before about what I did for a living, and that you know the drive back. I think we actually flew out of Detroit. Uh, we had, a, I know it was a long drive back to the airport after after seeing the movie, and uh, and we certainly talked more. And I I told Alex then, and I uh, uh, told my family later, the rest of my family, that I I needed to find some other way to earn a living, and. Uh, this, you know, taking Alex to to Bel Air with me to see the movie was a way of my beginning that journey <clears throat> to leave that industry and to to try to find the courage and to be held accountable to do exactly what I what I knew in my heart I needed to do. Um, so that was that was I, I think my my underlying motive. It wasn't just to to take Alex to see someone that might have a chance of meeting someone. Uh, that he admired <clears throat> to see a movie, but to uh, see a movie of great significance and that had a, a and, and 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 about the the work that I that I used to do for and do for a living and about the company that I used to work for. Mm -hmm. uh, so it, it was it, it was it was one of the most memorable times of my life, Michael. So I have to thank you for that. Uh, because it it was a turning point for me. It was I've wow. I've, I've written about that as you know. I did write a, a chapter in uh, in my book Deadly Spin yeah. about it uh, to give an account. Deadly of Spin, yes, yeah, the book. You know the the, the um, yes that that chapter is a, it's such a profound. Uh, when I read it, it reads like um, Saint Paul being knocked off his horse on the road to Damascus, um, <laughs> when like you had this moment and once. And look, we've all had these moments, I think, and on some level in our lives. You can't ever go back. You can't go back to the old way that you were living, um, especially when you realize that there, there is a, a more authentic way to, to live and, and a contribution to be made. Um, you know, I've used and, similar language. I, I've, uh, I, uh, I grew up at a, a, a Southern Baptist church in Tennessee, and I, uh, I, I when I experienced what I experienced that day, and then there were a couple of other things that happened uh, later in the year that uh, you know that was that, that contributed to my walking away from from my job. But it was a, it was kind of a spiritual awakening for me. Um, it was an epiphany to a certain extent. Uh, 
that I welcomed. Uh, again, I took Alex there, I think, with some uh, idea that uh, I needed to, to get a kick in the pants to, 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 to do what I, in my heart, knew that I needed to do. But I didn't have the courage. I didn't have uh, uh, anyone holding me accountable. I couldn't talk to really anyone at, at the office about this. And, and so there was some, some plan, uh, some, something that was going on that, that led me to raise my hand to go to Bel Air in the first place, to see the movie in person and to take Alex. Uh, and uh, uh, it, it truly was getting knocked off my horse and, and seeing things from a perspective I just wasn't willing to see before. So you say that you actually were, you'd maybe, you'd already been thinking about, geez, here I am, I'm the vice president of PR communications, but really it's propaganda. That's got to be hard. Just just the brief description you gave of your upbringing um, to have to essentially do this kind of accepted form of essentially lying um, that, that, you know, or a way to shape the truth in a way that it becomes another truth. And, um, that, and, 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 and I'm not pointing a finger at you because again, I think many people listening to this, um, we, we are all confronted with these situations in, in life. And I think in your case, if I can, I, you know, guess what might've happened here is if you are at your core, a moral person, if you were raised with a strong sense of right and wrong, that at some point you will reach the breaking point where it, you can't take it anymore. You can't do it anymore. It, it goes on and on. And something like you said, maybe you did it for 20, 20 years, Wendell, you did this 20 years. What does that do to any of us in terms of the stress that that causes, the, the, the scar tissue on our hearts, the ulcers, the, the, you know, uh, you know, at, at, and then the day happens and then you say, that's it. I'm out. I can't, I can't. How long was it after coming to Northern Michigan and meeting me, uh, seeing the, the premiere of the film and afterwards, how many more months or years, uh, had to go by, uh, before you just, before you said, I'm out, this is it. I'm not living my life like this anymore. Michael, it was a few months. Uh, just a few Just months. A few months. Yeah, I uh, I thought that I could act on it sooner than that, actually. But I was fifty five. I uh, I had a family, and you begin to think of all these reasons why you can't walk away from your job, despite uh, the crisis of conscience you might be having. You're uh, you've got house payments and car payments, and putting the kids through school. Uh, so you've got all of this that weighs on your mind as well, too. What I, I found uh, as I was going through this, you, you're able to compartmentalize. Uh, this is what I do for a living, but I do some good in the world, and I've got a good family, so I've got to take care of my family or help take care of the family. But still, uh, this it was it was something that persisted. This crisis of conscience, and I uh, continued to have to handle these high profile cases that I, I mentioned, like the ones that that you had in the movie. But there was one that happened <clears throat> that I wish could have been on a movie, uh, but it happened uh, a few months after the premiere. I got a call from a reporter in Los Angeles, a radio reporter who was wanting to know why Cigna was refusing to pay for a liver transplant for a 17-year-old girl uh, whose doctors said that she was a great candidate for a transplant. There was a, a liver waiting for the, for the surgery. Uh, uh, it was scheduled. And Instead, though, as uh, uh, on the morning that this, the, this, the transplant was to take place, and the family, her parents had gone to the hospital, UCLA, UCLA Medical Center, instead of um, being told where to wait for the, for the surgery, uh, they, was, they were told instead, we can't go forward with this because Cigna hasn't given us clearance. Uh, and uh, I got to know the family later on, and this is Sarkeesian. The young girl's name is Madeline Sarkeesian. Uh, she told me that, she said, well, what does Cigna have to do with this? We know transplants are covered under our benefit plan. Her father, Michael, worked for Mercedes. So this wasn't a Cadillac plan. This was a Mercedes plan. Uh, and uh, uh, they just assumed that there would be no problem, that the, the surgery would go forward. But no, uh, it turned out a medical director for Cigna, 2,500 miles away, uh, had to review the request. This is something else that you 
talked a little bit about in the movie, but has become and still is a huge problem. It's called prior authorization. Doctors increasingly have to uh, ask for approval from an insurance company b- before proceeding with a procedure. And that happened in this case. Uh, and uh, he refused to authorize coverage for the transplant. Um, so uh, the, it couldn't be scheduled. The liver had to go to somebody else. Uh, the doctors and the family appealed that decision, but it didn't do any good. So uh, the, uh, her parents decided, well, we'll see if we can raise a big PR stink about this. And they, they were able to get media attention focused on this case. Uh, that's why I got that, that first call from a, a reporter at a radio station in L.A. Uh, I didn't think much of it. I thought this, well, this is just like any other of countless high-profile stories slash horror stories that I'd, my team and I had dealt with over the years. But this one was different. Uh, and maybe I was just at that point that I just couldn't do any more of these. But still... I got more involved in this because it really did become a huge PR problem for the for the for the company. Uh, a lot of other reporters started to call. It, it got to be a national story. NBC and and CNN were doing stories about this, and I had to explain to the CEO that this was really becoming a big PR nightmare for Cigna. Uh, and uh, within a, a, a couple of days, the the company decided to. Uh, come around to reconsidering that denial. Uh, And so on December the 20th of 2007, just again, a few months after I went to to Michigan, uh, uh, the company decided to authorize payment for this liver transplant for Natalene Sarkeesian. Uh, And I was watching live on, on TV because CNN was covering a protest that this family had been able to stage in front of Cigna's Glendale, California regional offices. And I had to somehow get word to the family while the the cameras were rolling that Cigna had agreed to pay for the transplant. And I was watching as someone whispered into Mrs. Sarkeesian's ear something that made her obviously very happy because she started uh, hugging and and saying, Cigna's going to pay for it. Cigna's going to pay for it. And I felt pretty good about the role that I played maybe in in helping uh, Natalie Sarkeesian to get the the liver transplant that, that she needed. Wow. But several, several days had passed, though, Michael, since the original request was made, since that original prior authorization request was made. I think about five days altogether had passed. And by this time, by the time Cigna came around to agreeing to pay for it, um, she had gotten sicker and some of her other organs began to fail. And five hours after wow. uh, the family got this great news that Cigna was going to pay for it, Nedeline passed oh, away Jesus. at 17 years of age. Oh, I was thinking and, this uh, was, had a happy ending, this story. I did too, oh, and I had the, after Christ. after you know after we got word of the family, I went home and I uh, I thought, well, I uh, I really did pat myself a little bit on the back that I had played some role in maybe a happy ending, uh, but uh, in the middle of the night, I got this call that uh, that she had died, uh, and then I knew, gosh, this is really going to be a real hard hard one for me to be involved with because I had then my job was going to be trying to explain. Uh, you know, the Cygnus point of view, uh, the company's point of view on this. Uh, and I, my heart just wasn't in it. I had to do it. Uh, but a few days after she died, I uh, walked in and turned in my notice. And uh, I just said, I can't do this anymore. I've had a good long run here, uh, but uh, and I, I just can't do this anymore. I didn't, Michael, at that time, have any uh, uh, reason to think that I would ever become a vocal critic of the industry because I know from you know, just what I was doing to try to discredit you what the industry would try to do to discredit its critics. Uh, so I was, I was afraid. Uh, I, so I just decided I would go quietly away and maybe figure out some other way to uh, uh, bring in a few dollars uh, as a consultant or uh, maybe getting some other job. But I just knew I couldn't do that anymore. And so I walked away without anything uh, to go to. And uh, as it turned out, obviously, it was a, it was a right decision for me. But uh, I kept talking myself out of it because of, the fear of the unknown, the fear of what it would be like to have the industry come after me, and the fear of uh, uh, of, of retaliation and uh, not being able to, to find another job. So that that is one thing that holds people back. Uh, whistleblowers don't have a, um, a you know a, a lot of happy endings happy endings either. Um, and it, and I'm, I'm kind of getting ahead of myself, but I ultimately did decide to yeah. um, 
to be a very vocal critic to do something to do something what so yeah so you didn't leave Cigna with some big plan to take them down or uh, any of that sort of stuff it was it was um I just, I just can't, I can't show up every day and do this anymore. It was that, it was that. And, and I also knew uh, that it, I didn't have an extra grind with Cigna per se. I knew that everything that I was doing, somebody else at, at United or Aetna was doing the same kind of thing. Uh, and so when I did begin to, to, to speak out, uh, which was in congressional testimony uh, soon after President Obama, you know, started the, the whole effort to, uh, get the Affordable Care Act passed. Um, uh, I, uh, I, I agreed to testify, but I didn't at that time think I would ever have the nerve to do anything like that. Um, but I ultimately decided I just couldn't keep doing what I was doing. And, uh, uh, but like I said, I, I, uh, I guess I'm rambling a bit here, but I knew that the same thing went on at every other company. So it wasn't an X that I had to grind. I was grinding with Cigna. It was just the right. way the whole system had evolved. And uh, I, some people have asked me, why didn't I just try to stay in there and uh, uh, try to affect change from the inside? You cannot do it. Uh, the CEO couldn't even do it uh, because it is uh, – people don't really understand. The healthcare system is really run by Wall Street, by shareholders, by a few people whose name you've, you've never heard of, financial analysts that work at big banks who really call the shots – and uh, even the CEO doesn't have the ability to significantly change the way a company behaves and the, and the way it practices. If you do, you become uh, an anomaly and you might attract uh, 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 more sick patients or if you agree to do more transplants than, than Aetna does, uh, then there's this fear that you'll, you'll be paying more out in claims than, than Wall Street wants you to do. Uh, so, and I learned all this because during the, another thing that I did in the last 10 years of my, my career in the industry, I handled financial communications for Cigna. Uh, I was the guy on the phone explaining where the money came from and how we spent it every time the, the, you know, the, the, the company announced quarterly earnings. As, you, as, as United and others uh, were in that reporting season, every three months, these companies uh, announced their quarterly earnings. And the, the biggest imperative is that you never want to disappoint Wall Street. You always want to make sure that you're meeting Wall Street's profit expectations. You don't want to miss it by a penny. Uh, and the way you make profits if you're a health insurance company is to try and deny as many claims as possible. Exactly. Exactly. The, the, the doctor who denied the claim of this young 17-year-old woman who died, um, who never examined her himself, uh, just, you know, probably just got out the rubber stamp and said, uh, declined. Um, the, um, we did, we did show a little bit about how the system, this part of the system works in sicko, but, um, you're right. It, it is such, it is the, one of the grossest because ex- doctors are supposed to be there to cure, to help, uh, to treat, uh, not to let people die. And this, this, at, at many of the health insurance companies, and certainly we had a, a doctor who did this for Humana in the movie, and she explained the system there of how every December, the doctor that, that was able to decline and, 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 and win all the appeals the most got a bonus, like a big bonus, a big prize. Uh, the, the, in other words, the more people essentially that you killed or helped to kill, by denying the claim, you were rewarded financially for that at the health insurance company. People don't know this. They don't know that. This goes on. They don't know that. And and that medical director in Pittsburgh was just as much of a corporate employee as I was with the same expectations that you'll do your part uh, to help the company meet Wall Street's profit expectations. And um, uh, if you're not a team player, if you're if you're not delivering what the company expects, I mean, you don't have to have a memo that comes down from your manager that you will uh, uh, you will refuse or decline to pay for, or refuse to pay for X number of transplants or procedures. You know, you don't need that memo. You know that if you're going to get a raise or a bonus or a stock grant or stock option, uh, which everybody wants to have if they're eligible for it, then you've got to do your part. You've got to be perceived by management to be doing your part to meet Wall Street's profit expectations. That's how it really works inside these companies. That just seems 
so immoral <laughs> that we even have a system like this that allows this, that we, that we tie profit and the profit motive to people's health. It would be as crazy to me as if we, we wanted to make sure that the police department posted a good profit or the fire department or any of the other things that we depend on our government to do to protect us, to take care of us. And why health is not considered in that in the same vein as defense or fire or police, education, any of the things that we, we demand the government be there for us. And instead, we allow private profit-making corporations to call the shots. It's, it's, it, um, I don't understand why we even have health insurance companies. I guess I understand why, you know, I want a homeowner's <laughs> policy. You know, if my house burns down, um, somebody sues me because I didn't get out and shovel the snow quick enough and they fall and break a leg or whatever. I, I, I kind of get the idea of insurance in those cases. I don't get it for, I don't get health insurance. No, you're not I wrong. don't. You're not wrong. Uh, I don't you know, understand I, it. I, I call myself, my former self, a propagandist, and, and propaganda works. Uh, my former colleagues and I persuaded uh, the public to believe that uh, healthcare should be operated as a business, uh, and, uh, and and health insurance certainly that way. And we've been led to believe that government is bad, and that any kind of involvement in any part of our lives is is not good. People forget about the, the police department and the fire department, uh, but they've been persuaded that uh, private insurance companies can do a better job than the government. And that's why the Republicans 10 years ago uh, or longer uh, railed against Obamacare as a government takeover of health care. Uh, the term was that phrase was carefully chosen because uh, of the decades of, of work on behalf of not just the insurance industry, but a lot of industries to, to get people to dislike, to fear uh, their government and to think that uh, business was good, government is bad. So that's part of a big part of this. And that was part of what I was caught up in for, for, for many, many years to try to persuade people that uh, you know, you, insurance companies had a, a, a very vital role to play in our healthcare system, uh, and people bought it. Uh, and you know, obviously now I'm trying to, uh, un, uh, to to get people to understand what it was and how effective propaganda is. What it was I used to do for a living, and how effective it was uh, that I was able to get people to believe a bunch of lies. Uh, and uh, I hate to admit it, but I was pretty darn good at what I did. Um, uh, and, and, and and that work goes on. It continues. Uh, there is no real reason why uh, insurance companies should exist. No other country in the developed world has a system like ours in which uh, uh, the nation has, uh, for all practical purposes, turned over the keys of the healthcare system to a few healthcare, health insurance company executives. And that's what has happened. We have allowed this to happen uh, over many years. We've allowed our policymakers to turn a blind eye, blind eye to uh, uh, what you and I in recent years have been have been talking about and, and showing uh, in your movies and your TV shows before that. Uh, but um, uh, there have been decades of just unrelenting propaganda from the insurance industry to uh, get people to believe that they have some essential and vital role to play in our healthcare system. Yeah, they have one role, and that's to make profit money for their investors. Yes, exactly. And I... They they serve no real purpose. I, I I just they save no lives. They they find no cure for cancer. They don't. They I it's 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 just amazing that we allow it to go on. And I think that during the Democratic Party debates this year, when uh, it went from that first debate, if you remember, the the moderator asked uh, who on the stage here supports Bernie's. Medicare for all program. And I believe all but one, um, Delaney, I think it's the only one maybe that wouldn't raise his hand. They all raised their hand that they're, and then bit by bit, debate after debate, fewer hands, fewer support, less support, even among some, some people we really like, um, got afraid or they still supported it, but they couldn't quite explain it. 
couldn't quite explain how it would be paid for. Um, it's so funny. I'm laughing because we've now learned that the government can pay for anything and can afford anything. <laughs> and, and the fact that we don't look at our healthcare problem as an emergency, as a crisis, obviously not a crisis that is going to kill you or I tonight, like this virus could, but nonetheless, climate change, that that's not that the climate emergency is not a crisis. They could, uh, they can come up with the money. We now know that, right, Wendell? They can come up with the money. Yeah, they can. You know, back to what you were saying about the, the debates, uh, the media, the moderators were in, in a large way complicit uh, and, and, and carrying the industry's water with the questions they asked, the stupid questions about how you're going to pay for it was asked time and time again uh, without getting into any substance, any, any of the details about why Medicare for all made sense and how it would actually operate. Uh, that's what those questions were what the insurance industry wanted. Those are the questions I would have slipped to the moderators to ask. Because it is, you can't answer them necessarily in a soundbite, uh, and in the constraints of a debate, uh, the the you know the candidates knew that they would have a hard time. Let me let me underscore what you're saying here, because I'll tell you from my own personal experience, the people that hold your job, your former job, in these companies, um, they on those debate days and the days before, they are doing their best to lobby the networks, to lobby to get questions asked, to help. You know, they'll they'll present an expert you know, not necessarily the PR person, but they'll represent a doctor to help the people that are going to be asking the questions or to help the news editor, some faceless person you don't even know to understand the issue so that the question gets asked in the right way. So they don't look, you know, stupid. And, um, and I'll tell you this from my own experience with sicko, um, Oprah, uh, saw, um, a screening of it and insisted that I like, come on and turn the whole hour over to just Oprah and me talking about this issue of for-profit healthcare. It was, it was an incredible uh, show. Um, not long after that aired, maybe minutes, <laughs> the, the main lobbyist for what was the name of the, the association of all the health insurance, um, America's health insurance plans. Yes. Yeah. America's health yeah. insurance plans <laughs> is on the phone with the producer howling about why you let Michael Moore on, you know, they thought they'd done their job, right? As you said, they were supposed to discredit me and, you know, push me off the cliff. Here I am on Oprah instead. And so, and so uh, Oprah's producers call and they say, um, we'd like to do a second show on Sicko. I thought, oh, good. And <laughs> except, uh, do, do you mind? Um, we're going to, we're going to also bring on uh, this woman from the America's, Health plans? Is that what it's called? Yeah. America's health insurance health plans. Insurance plans. Yeah. <laughs> I said, sure. I actually, I like, I like having a debate and oh my God, she came on, you know, cause they had to have their say. Yeah. And she just beautifully light up a storm and did it in such a good way. Mm. So nothing sounded like a lie. Yeah. And, and she starts by telling this story of how her father, she was raised in a union household. Oh, yes. Karen Ignani. Yes, you know exactly know what I'm about. talking about. I sure she, do. <laughs> she tells this whole story. He was a firefighter. He was a union member. They were Democrats. And just trying to win over Oprah's audience. And, and um, but, you know, this is, this is happening. Um, this is in the year before Obama's election. And, of course, he had made, you know, health care part of his, you know, platform. And uh, they didn't know where this was going to go. This is before we, you know, uh, the Affordable Care Act, Obamacare, any of that stuff. Um, but they, the people that, that do the job that you used to do are very, very good at it. They have to be good at it because it's, it's real snake oil. It is. And, being and that, person you, that person you mentioned, I know her well, and she was probably the, the, the best that I'd ever seen in terms of doing exactly what you described. Um, and I, in fact, I began my book, Deadly Spin, with a quote of hers uh, when she was among the, 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 the several people that Obama assembled in the White House as he was kicking off what became the debate on the Affordable Care Act. 
uh, she stood up and said, Mr. President, you can count on us to, to help with this. I'm, I'm paraphrasing here, but to yeah. count on us to do the right thing. Uh, very, very skillful and, uh, uh, and believable. Uh, yes. uh, that's, that's what it takes. I and mean, you've got to be someone who is able to, to do that. And, uh, uh, and that's why, that, that's why it is, 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 you look at why attitudes are as they are, uh, and why people put up with the insurance industry. Um, I was quoted in an article, I think just today in the San Francisco Chronicle or the other day, uh, up to explaining this. That people actually, you know, go through day, year after year being fairly healthy and not really testing the limits of their health insurance policy. What has changed with this pandemic is that more and more people are realizing just the limitations of their coverage and how uh, mm-hmm. the the decisions that are made by insurance companies really do have life and death consequences and then how right. the employer based system is not as uh, the candidates on the debate stage a month just a month ago hardly were saying we've got to protect the employer based system because people love their their health insurance to their employer i knew that was a bunch of bull because year after year we did surveys knowing that People did not love their insurance companies. What they wanted them to do is- No, they have to fight with the insurance company all the yeah. time. They, they they have to, they're constantly being told they can't see that doctor, not in that work. Uh, they, the doctor, their doctor has sent them to a specialist, can't see that specialist, uh, denied. Yeah. Over and over and over yeah. again. I don't know anybody who loves, <laughs> loves their insurance company. I know people who love their doctor. I know people who actually love the local hospital- um, you know, but love your insurance company. <laughs> yeah. Nobody, that, no, nobody does that. What's, what's wrong with the Democrats that they kept saying that line about, and I kept, I, what I did was I pointed out to everybody being from Michigan that remember back when the workers at the UAW went on strike back in October, that within three or four days, the CEO of General Motors cut, ended their health insurance. People could not believe it. That UAW health insurance, people have had that for half a century or longer and could not believe that suddenly the really, I think one of the best health insurance plans probably in the country, auto workers, boom, like in a snap of the fingers. That's how long it took the CEO of General Motors. On one side of the snap, they had health insurance and three seconds later, their health insurance was gone because one person could end that, had the power to end that for them. Who wants a system that allows the boss to wake up on the wrong side of the bed on any given morning and say, you know what? We're going to, we're going to double the deductible. Eh, You know what? We're going to triple the copay. You know what? Why are we even paying for health insurance? Let them buy their own on Obamacare. You know, that, that the fact that the boss, the owners, the board, whoever it is, can literally that quickly decide to alter your health care, increase, decrease the benefits, increase the premium, or just get rid of it altogether. They can do that right now, right while you and I are talking on this podcast. Any company can do that, has the right to do that, especially now Look during this pandemic. And look how many people, you know, the government's done a great job of providing Unemployment insurance, states and the federal government, that bill that passed, lots of lots of um, decent unemployment insurance money in that bill. What kind of money to keep everybody on their health care, on their employee-based health care? Nothing. Zero. Wow. Yeah. Wow. That's, I got to tell you, Wendell, from the mail I've been getting um, these last couple of weeks, it's the number one thing on people's minds. And why would it be number one? Because we're in the middle of a health epidemic. What's the one thing you don't want to lose during the health of it? I'd, I'd rather lose my pay than, than lose the ability to get help, serious help that's going to cost a lot of money if I go to the ICU. I'm going to, it's, it has unraveled people. I'm sure you've heard from people. Oh, like I have. This about this. All the time. Uh, I hear it all the time. I heard it all the time before. Uh, you were asking why would Democrats on the debate stage, or or, or whether they're on, running for uh, Congress, why would they support keeping this system? And I it, it continues to baffle me. But I think there are two reasons. One is campaign money. Uh, a lot of them are Democrats and Republicans alike are, are accepting a lot of campaign cash 
from uh, insurance company executives. That it's 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 one thing that influences them. I, you know, I wrote a book called Nation on the Take about this and how it how it happens. It's not rocket science. We know that this goes on. The other is they 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 willingly accept the talking points from from the industry, and they have been led to fear that the industry will uh, campaign against them or fuel campaign or or, or attack ads uh, and support their their opponents if they uh, dare to do anything other than than uh, carry water for the industry. That is, I think, really what's going on here. The, the other is that people have been lulled into a sense of false security about their employer-based health insurance. Uh, they don't give it much thought uh, in normal times, uh, just assuming that the, the coverage will be there. They don't really give much thought to the consequences of a layoff or uh, a plant closing until it happens. And now we're seeing it in mass numbers. And it's I think it's beginning to sink in to more and more people that this system that we've had for decades, it's been crumbling, by the way, Michael, for many decades, uh, 20 years ago, uh, m- more people had health insurance through their employer than they do now. And the population has increased 50 million since that time. But we've been led to believe by uh, even Democratic candidates that somehow we need to uh, preserve the employer-based system, that it's sacred, that it is, it is secure. And uh, we're obviously saying that it is anything but that right now. The um, the aforementioned uh, Karen, uh, uh, how do you say her last name? Karen Ignani, Ignani. Yeah, she was on the woman who was on Oprah with me from the health insurance industry, the lobbyist. Um, after the show, back in the green room, she says to me, and I don't know if it was off the record or not, but I think there's a ten year statute of limitations for this. So this is <laughs> 2007, I think. So I, um, I think I'm okay in in telling this. I, I don't think actually. Um, I was going to say, I don't think she would mind, but on some level, I don't care if she minds because I really want people to hear this. She said to me then, this is now, remember, 2007. She said, look, we know that the way it's set up now is not going to continue forever. Um, And many of us, especially the companies where health insurance is just one part of their insurance empire, like Aetna, you know, others, that Edna has all all kinds of you know insurance that they do. That they know more than anyone else. They're already making their contingency plans. She said to me, for when you, meaning me, your side wins on this issue. Um. So, just so you know, I'm also aware of the position that we're in, and um, and we will make sure that um, you know. There will always be insurance companies and there will be an insurance industry and it will make good profits for, um, you know, their investors, for their shareholders. We may lose a piece of this battle to you, uh, but we will survive. Her acknowledgement, knowing that, that there had already been a shift in public opinion, that people actually were not in love with their health insurance companies and that so many people had lost loved ones because of denial of claims, because of denial of treatment. So you can't do that to so many thousands, hundreds of thousands of Americans who never read their health insurance policy, never just thought, wow, I've got a, yeah, I got a great, I got a Blue Cross plan, top of the line, Cadillac version. You know, that's what he used to say in Flint. And, and nobody, none of us ever read the 62 page plan or however many pages it was in, in like four point type, nobody read it. And, um, and then they're completely surprised when they're presented with this clause, when they get sick, when their husband gets sick, when somebody needs them, they fight them tooth and nail to, to never have to, never have to pay up. Michael, that is a fascinating story that you told about her. And that is, <clears throat> I've never told I've never told that story, and I, I because even for the, even for people that are I disagree with, I mean I, I give them uh, if I tell them I'm you know you can tell me I needed to hear it, but I've held it all these years now. It's thirteen thirteen years. It's fascinating uh, since I I heard this, and um, it's it, we're in a war right now on, on many levels, a war against this virus. Uh, we're we're in a fight 
to see that Trump doesn't get another four years. And, but we're in a, a larger fight that, that predates Trump. And, and that's, and that's the, the, the fight against greed, greed, and, the, and this sort of um, disgusting, cruel system that would actually let somebody die uh, just because it meant it's going to look, it's going to look good on the ledger at the end of the year for an increase of profits. Yeah. Karen was telling you the truth uh, back then. And around that time, I was in a, a leadership meeting with our CEO at the time at Cigna. Uh, Ed Hanway was his name. And someone asked him what kept him up at night. And uh, he said uh, what kept him up at night, what he was afraid of was that someday uh, the company's customers would begin to question, and I'm using some lar- jargon here, question the company's value proposition or the industry's value proposition. In other words, he was saying Mm -hmm. that at some point uh, the public would wake up to realize that insurance companies don't really serve a useful role. And we've, we've been seeing that. And she's right too. These companies have seen the handwriting on the wall for a long time now. Uh, They've been diversifying all these big companies like the ones that I work for Humana and Cigna have diversified over the years. The biggest United healthcare its uh, fastest growing division is called Optum. Uh, they don't sell insurance. Uh, they make money in many d- different ways. I've often said that when we were talking, uh, when candidates were debating about what will happen when we go to Medicare for all and all these uh, employees of insurance companies, what are they going to do when these companies shut down? They're not going to shut down. She was she was being very prescient. This mm. w- these companies. Uh, will continue to to operate. They know how to make money. They know how to uh, shape shift and to create do something else. When I joined Humana back in 1989, it was largely a hospital company. While I was there, they sold all the hospitals to focus on managed care. When I joined Cigna, it was a big multi line insurance company that had auto insurance. It had uh, property and casualty insurance. It sold those. But it has been uh, acquiring different kinds of companies in the years since I've left. So these companies will be around. They'll morph into something else. But she's right. Uh, There will come a day, and it's coming sooner than I think a lot of people realize, when those companies will not be providing basic health insurance. We've already seen, if you pay pay close close attention to their earnings statements, which I still do, uh, you'll see that. Uh, their, what they refer to as their commercial membership has been declining year after year after year. Uh, and that's because people can't afford their policies. And more and more businesses are getting out. Uh, they, they, they've thrown in the towel. They can't continue to offer coverage to their workers. So the employer-based system has been crumbling uh, and now it's collapsing. So that's what's going you know, to... I, I, uh, she, she said that in 2007. It's taken a few years. It may take a few years longer but it's inevitable. Uh, that system is going to go away. It's going to be replaced mm. by by something that is more progressive. I have no doubt about it. That's why I still, uh, I'm still in this fight and still doing what I'm doing, because it's going to happen. We just need to advocate for it to happen sooner rather than later. Can't we make that happen now in the pandemic, in the post-pandemic? Can't we just all get together and say, and, and I'm talking about sitting down at the table, even with people we disagree with and say, look, the, we just saw we just saw the truth and we saw the writing on the wall. Let's, let's all agree to end this, you know, c- companies that want to make profits. There's other ways they make profits. I remember after, I remember a general motors person saying to me, somebody, you know, not mid-level executive after I made my first film, Roger, me telling me that you, one, one thing you don't understand about general motors is you think we're a car company. We're a bank. GMAC, we finance so many loans, millions and millions and millions of loans, and that's how we make our money. The car is just the, no pun intended, vehicle by which we can make our profit off you by getting you to finance it through GMAC. I was like, wow, I never looked at it that way. In a very similar way, insurance companies are are the same thing. They've even referred to themselves more as financial services companies uh, than they have insurance. In fact, if you look on the websites of these companies, you'll be hard pressed to find the word manage words managed care or insurance anymore. Uh, they're in the health services business. 
um, mm, uh, right. which is another uh, giveaway to where they see uh, their ability to make money in the in the current environment, much less the future. But they they've they've begun that transition. They have some time ago. Can we do this? Can we post pandemic? Can we make this happen? I mean, I saw when when Bernie and Biden met the other day, and um, they announced they were going to have these six task forces of people from each of their campaigns work out what the policy should be at the convention of, on various issues from criminal justice to minimum wage to a whole bunch of things, you know, climate change. And one of the things on that list was not health care. Yeah. Did you see that? I did. And I, I, I was completely baffled as well, too. I do not know. I did talk to someone this week uh, who's uh, an advisor to the, the Biden campaign. And he said, he told me that Biden and, and, uh, and Sanders get along well. Uh, they've had conversations, uh, uh, the, the two of them have, and that uh, Biden's uh, uh, embracing the lowering of the age of eligibility for Medicare to the age of 60 uh, was as a you know, direct result, uh, as a, he characterized it, of a request from, from, from Bernie Sanders. I think that may be the case, but I can't imagine that Bernie wouldn't have asked for more than that, or that there wouldn't be some uh, task force set up on health care, for God's sake. I mean, this is the, the one thing that is facing this nation uh, that is uh, going to be the financial ruin of a lot of people unless we actually begin, uh, while we're dealing with this pandemic, to look at what is coming after this. There are a lot of employers uh, who are that are not going to make it again. I mean, they're not going to be coming back. These A lot of these jobs are not going to be coming back with benefits. So for there not to be a task force, uh, is, is just beyond belief. Uh, I think we can do it to answer your question. I think that uh, those of us who are in this uh, uh, to support Medicare for All or whatever we want to call it, uh, uh, we've got to stay in, in this fight. And I certainly am. I've, I've gone, jumped back into advocacy myself because I think this is a moment that, um, that, that we have to seize and that we can because uh, people, you, it may take something like this to wake people up to realize just how insecure uh, their access to health care is, uh, how much they have to, uh, you know, a re- realization of how much they now have to pay even out of their own pockets before their coverage kicks in. Uh, this, I, I, I do think that we as advocates, uh, those of us who support uh, this kind of a policy, uh, need to stay in this and not be dispirited because Sanders has suspended his campaign, but to regroup and to put pressure on on the Democrats, uh, regardless of of what they're running for. T- uh, just a few days ago, by the way, I uh, one of the things I'm doing is is working with candidates down ballot, those who are running for Congress or Senate, uh, mm. and who have expressed some interest in knowing more about Medicare for all. And there are many of them who who are. Uh, I was on a on a, a, a conference call with twenty about two dozen of them just a few days ago. So there is there is still a lot of interest, and I think a lot of candidates are are realizing this is an issue that uh, that people continue to support. As and as we saw during every single primary that has been held to date, uh, or a caucus, including the the red states. I'm from Tennessee, <clears throat> and even in Tennessee and Mississippi and South Carolina. More than half of those who voted, regardless of who they voted for, said they supported replacing private insurance companies with a government financed plan right. like Medicare. That's for right. All. Every single even state. states like Mississippi, Alabama. Yes. Right. Yes. So the public is with us. Uh, it is uh, you know our, our political leaders that are are not have not caught up with it yet, uh, and I think our what what is incumbent upon us is to uh, make sure that uh, there is a lot of pressure applied to the Biden campaign, uh, if there's a transition team uh, to, uh, uh, if he's elected, to make sure that health care and, and, and moving in the right direction is, is central to what, uh, uh, what the, the, the transition team is all about, it has to be. So for the people listening right now, what, what can you tell them? What can they do? What can they do? Uh, even sitting at home, uh, or if they're in quote, essential worker, um, God bless them. Um, you know, what, what can people do right now, or at least think about doing once 
were, were through this uh, pandemic? Stay educated. Uh, I mean, there are organizations like uh, uh, like some that I'm a part of that I, I, I want people to, to know more about. It is a place for people to come together to support this effort. Uh, one of the nonprofits that I lead is called Medicare for All Now. Uh, we uh, exist uh, to help push this, this forward. Uh, check us out because uh, we are among the organizations that is really pushing for this and will continue to, to do that. Uh, the other organization is called Business for Medicare for All Now. And uh, the reason that I'm leading that is because I keep hearing from businesses across the country that they are fed up with this, this system. Um, uh, fewer and fewer can offer benefits. Uh, and mm. particularly right now, as many of them are, are laying workers off, some of them are trying to figure out if they can come back at all. Uh, they can't come back being saddled with the responsibility of offering benefits to their workers. So I think I want business right. leaders to step up and be more vocal yeah. this time uh, and and reach out to me because uh, through the organizations that I just mentioned, Business for Medicare for All, uh, .org and, and Medicare for All .org. Uh, there are many others, as you know, out there. There are yeah. organizations of physicians, Physicians for National Health Program. Public Citizen is an organization that is uh, is involved in this. So there are a lot of organizations that uh, are not uh, putting this aside just because Bernie Sanders has suspended his campaign. We know that right. there's work that has to be done. So uh, get involved, uh, support organizations that support this. Write letters to your members of Congress. There are more than half of the Democratic caucus that has signed on to Pramila Jayapal's bill that would uh, establish a Medicare for All program. But there are several who haven't. Uh, so put pressure on your, your elected officials to sign on as sponsors of this bill. Tell them that this is, this is more urgent than it ever has been. Uh, and uh, to, to, uh, to, to write letters to the editor. Do, do those kinds of things you can do as an individual but uh, I, I think you can do a lot more by affiliating with organizations that support this. And there are plenty who are not going to be going, going away just because Bernie Sanders is, is not campaigning for president now. And people could sign up uh, to your site. Uh, this, we haven't even got into this. You, will you come back? Because we, we, got, yes. we have a lot more to talk about uh, if, sure. we're gonna get, if we're going to get this uh, health care passed for everyone. You, uh, you started up this organization called Tarbell, tarbell.org. Tarbell is just like it sounds, tar, T-A-R. Bell, B-E-L-L. And you named it after a very famous, no longer remembered, uh, investigative reporter, activist, um, um, before the term consumer advocate even existed, yeah. uh, way back, I don't know, what, 100 years ago? It was. It was in the early 1900s. Um, Ida, right? Ida Tarbell. Ida, Tar Ida, Ida Tarbell. Yeah. And, um, and uh, she went up against uh, John D. Rockefeller and Standard Oil, and um, was a real hero amongst people at that time uh, who were trying to fight the robber barons, and um, and so you've named your thing after her. It's it's I love this site. It's at just tarbell dot org tarbell all one word dot org, and um, it it every week you post incredible information, investigative reporting, essays, think pieces. Um, um, about Medicare for all, but also lots of other issues that uh, are tangential to this. And it's it's um, I encourage people to to check this out. And and um, I think it's incredible that you've you've gone all the way from spying on me <laughs> and uh, and being sent to Michigan to push me over a cliff uh, to wreck my life. Um, to to you have been a fighter now for. Geez, at least a decade, um, on for all the right things uh, and all the good you've done. I hope that that your conscience and all that not only is at rest uh, in the sense that um, you have more than made up <laughs> for what for what uh, you know at least for what you did for me or to me or whatever you you failed sadly i mean not sadly for me <laughs> not sadly for the film but uh, i never see never like to see a person fail but um <laughs> but no but seriously all kidding aside um you're uh if if 
John F. Kennedy were alive and we're going to write a sequel to Profiles and Courage. You're one of those people. And I know you're, you're, you get embarrassed by that because you're going to tell me now, yes, but for 20 years, I pumped it out. I kept pumping out the propaganda, but you know, um, hopefully everybody has their moment when they realize that life is about something else and could be better. And Wendell, you've, you've done that. And, um, so when you come back on next time, let's talk, let's talk about some of the issues you've brought up in Tarbell and, um, the other activist work, uh, in the Medicare for all, um, uh, organization. What's the, what's the, uh, um, the, the, the site again for that. Medicare for all.org, uh, Medicare for all now.org. Uh, Medicare for all now. Dot org. Org. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and, and Michael, thank you. I appreciate that. I've often said that I, I'm doing this because I feel in this obligation to make amends for those decades that I uh, was working on the other side. Uh, and I, I hope that, that what I've done is somewhat of an encouragement to others. If you have this inkling that what you're doing is, is not the right thing, um, don't let fear hold you back. Uh, it does for so many people and almost did for me, but I can uh, I can assure you that it's um, uh, it's not always a worst case scenario. And I find that I'm sleeping a lot better at night and feel like I'm really doing something that uh, might have a positive impact on people's lives. Well, and your kids must be very proud of you. I think you they know. are. Thank you. It took, um, you know, we've laughed about it here, but it took a lot of courage <laughs> to come there that day. Uh, to Michigan, you had no idea what was going to happen, and um, it. Um, you know, I'm glad you were there. I hope the popcorn was okay. Uh, popcorn was good. And I'm looking at a hat that I got there. I just uh, uh, every now and then wear Java Joe's Cafe cap that I got somewhere. When I Java was there. Joe's, yes, <laughs> <laughs> so, still there, still there. It's um, great. This one, we have to win on this one. We really have to uh, post Bernie. Post pandemic, um, everybody sees the light now. And the idea of tying your health insurance to your job is idiocy. And no other country does this. And they don't, you know, the only thing they tie to the job is they tax the employer for it. But even, even after when my movie came out, car people in Detroit, General Motors types, Chrysler, Ford said to me, that they would prefer to build their cars in Canada than in the U.S. because they don't have to pay any benefits in Canada. They have to pay a little more tax for it, but the little more they pay in tax to get that free health care for everybody is so much cheaper than what they have to pay in the U.S. to pay the benefits. And when this one guy explained this to me, it was like, no, you've got to understand we're on your side on this one um, because because it's it's so much better to have the government paying all these uh, benefits. Also, he said <clears throat> it's good for us too because we're we have a more productive assembly line workforce in Canada than we do in the U.S. Because first of all, nobody comes to work sick, because which then makes everybody else sick, which then lowers productivity. They go to a doctor because they don't have to worry about a copay or a deductible or anything. They just go, they get in. All the lies that have been told about Canadian healthcare, you get right in. You know, <laughs> you can see the doctor. And and if you need to take a little time off because you're sick, uh, you don't have to worry about not being able to pay the rent that month. It's such a saner system. And the employers in Canada love it. Uh, that's why your business group is such a good idea because once they really study it and they see Oh, this is, this is even good for business and good for our work product, good for our employees. It's always better to have happier, healthier employees than ones that are scared shitless that they could end up losing their house if they get sick. That's an awful feeling to have. So, um, so for all of those reasons, you and I, everybody listening to this, we've got to make this happen. Um, as soon as we, get the White House and the Senate back. We can do that. Uh, we've been talking to Wendell Potter, who is the former uh, vice president of Cigna um, and the author of Deadly Spin. And uh, what was the other book? I forgot. Um, Nation on the Take, How Big Money oh, Corrupts Nation Democracy. On the Democracy. Yeah, yes. Great. Important book for right now. Nation on the Take. Um, read his books. Go to tarbell.org. Um, support his and their work. 
and um, and we will have a better world once we're through this virus. So um, thank you again, and thank you, all of you who are listening uh, to this. Uh, please let me know how you feel about it. Send me your comments on the pl- platform. Uh, record a voicemail. Please share this with your friends and family of this podcast. Uh, uh, s- sign them up. Subscribe. It's all free. Um, means a lot that uh, you guys are listening to me, all of you out there in this country and in Canada and around the world. Uh, I greatly appreciate it. And, um, and I forgot to, I forgot to mention um, here uh, the other day, uh, we just had our 8 millionth download, 8 million. We've only been, we haven't even done this for four months. It's, it's, it's less than four months old. And, um, and we've had 8, <laughs> 8 million downloads. It's absolutely incredible. Um, nobody told us that we would get to this point, um, in less than four months, um, maybe four years, but, uh, so thank you to all of you who've been listening and been sharing it with others. Please continue to do that. And, um, we'll, um, see you soon. Thanks. Thanks again, Wendell. Thank you, Michael. Thanks so much. All right. Be well, everybody stay safe. Wash your hands. Bye.